everybody. I am super thrilled and excited because my friend, uh, former teacher, and uh, which feels weird to say, doesn't it? And and uh, <laughs> just a wonderful all around, uh, wonderful musician and person, Goth Bodsley is here all the way from the UK. Hi, Goth. Hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Marco. Hi. Hi. I, could, I couldn't have butchered that more. You know, I have been working on my British act. It's absolutely awful. It's terrible. Well, it's just, better than the American one. So, hey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Garth, before we start, like, you, you are just like, you, you do so many things. And I was curious, like, why don't you just give us like a 30 second, like, who are you? You can go as deep as you like, or you can just be very like, this is what I do. Or you can, you know, talk about, you know, the, the deep quality, you know, whatever. You, you take the stage. Well, uh, when I was a chorister at Manchester Cathedral, um, I got into trouble for, or I wanted to leave or something. And the organist at the time said, uh, you've got to be careful, Garth. This was to an 11-year-old child. If you don't engage and focus on one thing, you'll end up as a jack of all trades. And this thing has stuck with me all my life, that I'm a jack of all trades and not a a master of any. Mm. And actually, I prefer to think of myself as a bit of a renaissance man. Um, (laughs) Because, you know, I'm an award-winning opera director. I have Mm. taught you in America, in two universities America. I've got a, a university positions here in Britain. I'm a, a, a published author, a lyricist, librettist, um, poet. I work with two wonderful um, c- uh, composers. And I've had a very busy acting and singing career throughout my entire life, uh, where I've done opera, musical theatre. And to this day, I still do quite a lot of session work uh, with London Voices. And we do um, a lot of film tracks, but we also do stuff for video games as well. So I've been very, very fortunate um, in my career. I mean, it's one of those careers, as you can Uh imagine. Um, And uh, sometimes (laughs) the flowers bloom, sometimes they wither. Um, (laughs) But the, the the main thing is, you know, the people I meet, the experiences I've had, um, are extraordinary. Just just returned from Vienna directly to operas with a, mostly Americans and American company. And again, a, another wonderful experience. Um, and working with young people and doing the session work and that stuff, I kind of feel like I'm still hanging on in there with down with the kids a little bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> fading fast. <laughs> yeah, I feel the yeah, same. <laughs> I do, I do. I've always done a lot of stuff. I do a lot of stuff. Um, and I, I keep writing, and you know, it's 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 wonderful. I think, and and the fact that we're still, you know, we're able to communicate in the way we do, um, mm. fifteen years after I taught you, and all that sort of stuff is just yeah, fantastic. it is crazy. You were the first person I remember because when I was knee deep in opera at that point, I was super obsessed with opera. That was, I think, my junior year of uh, of undergrad, and uh, I uh, I remember you were the first and only person to be like hey, this is not going in the direction you want it to go. We need to adjust some technical things. And I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> and I remember I was like, yeah, I like this guy because he told me the truth and I, I trust that. So I, you know, I, I've never forgotten that moment in the cafeteria where you were like, so, you said, you said, it sounds like you're singing with marbles in your mouth. <laughs> yeah, never, never known for my tact. <laughs> I was like, mm, okay. <laughs> but the thing is, Marco, what I heard in you was, you know, you had this wonderful Italianate sound. It was sitting yeah. there waiting to happen. And you had the physique and you had the, 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 the they cut the the tessitura you had the yeah. light and everything yeah. um, but it was going nowhere it was sort of just going round and round in your head and yeah and, yeah yeah uh and you know you did wonderful things and you, you became a great singer in your own time so yeah fantastic yeah no it's true i i was happy with where i where i ended things i mean i did yeah. there was always more to do but in, in terms of well I mean, that's a separate discussion we don't have to talk about that oh absolutely but <laughs> the thing is you know you're a good musician you're a great singer um mm. You're not doing it today. You're doing it tomorrow. You might do it in a year's time. There's yeah. other stuff along the way. Yeah. I do all- covers now for video game tracks, actually, which is even oh, crazier. Fun. For fun, you know. Yeah. And then yeah. and then people watch it and let me know in the comments, and they're much harsher than you ever were. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, it's so a uh, out there, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, sure is, isn't it? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> um, so my plan for today is uh, just a bunch of video game songs. Some you may know, some you may not know. Probably you may not because I know that you're not uh, like super well versed in video games. Besides what you've done in session, which what have you done in session? Well, I always forget everything. I've done Final Fantasy several times. We did live concerts with those, which were just... Which one? Oh, Distant Worlds? Uh, 25th anniversary, so it was... Um, nice. Okay, so about 10 years ago. And, and, a, and a lovely story about that was uh, that they they decided to do this world tour, yeah. and um, they got in touch with the Royal Albert Hall, which seats 5,000 people, mm-hmm. and um, they said, we'd like to book a concert. It's a, it's a, a video game thing to celebrate 25 years, yeah. and, and, and so the Royal Albert Hall thought... 
oh good, we can give them um, November the 5th, which is bonfire night in Britain. So because no one wants to book that in Britain, so this date's oh. empty. So they said, you know, we'll give them that and th- th- whatever. So they said, oh, right, fine. Not knowing what it was, fine, we'll do November yeah. the 5th. Uh, the box office opened within two hours it had sold out. Yeah, I know. And then we did another <laughs> version of that uh, about a year later. And of course, there's, like, a oh. mini, there's a little mini opera in Final Fantasy, isn't there? Draco and Maria, yes, Final Fantasy VI. Draco yeah. and Maria, yeah. Did you sing in that? You sang, did you yeah, sing yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah. I didn't sing that. No, my fellow Philip, Philip Sheffield sang. Um, nice. Draco, and I forget, Ro- Rosie. Um, well, then right. you've, I, I've included one track in here from uh, a couple of tracks in here from and Final Benjamin Fantasy. Bevan was the bass in it. And he is an international baritone. So, you know, you had crazy serious singers. I mean, seriously, seriously. Good but, singers. you know, but this this opens up a serious discussion. And, and part of the reason why I've been doing this and introducing people in the classical world to, to music like this is because I actually feel like it, I my personal mission, my life's mission is to to really get this video game music to be se- not separate from with these pops concerts as great as they are. But you see even the Royal Alberhof, that 5,000 people, if you program a Beethoven and Mozart and then an intermission and you throw in some Final Fantasy in there or whatever, <laughs> like Monster Hunter, no one's going to be worse for the wear. You don't even have to say who it is. Like you just, and they're going to be like, wow, who's this new composer from Japan? And we've been doing it for 30 years. I think there's, it's a huge, dis- obviously there's money involved and and you yeah. know all these other yeah. things but but that in my ideal world we mesh uh you know video game music with the standard classical repertoire and then everybody benefits uh, why not why not this yeah why not so anyway first thing we're going to listen to today is called arcane just from ace combat 7 uh it's uh ace combat 7 is uh, a fighter pilot game where you play uh, you play as a fighter pilot uh, it's very intense, and uh, I would would call it a, a new oratorio. And um, it's fantastic music. Uh, it's 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 got like a weird mix of not this particular track, but Ace Combat Seven has this beautiful thing that it somehow is able to combine like 1980s bands and 90s bands like Steely Dan, The Eagles, you know, a ZZ Top kind of stuff with like. Um, with also like like full Latin chorus, it's a very interesting musical experience. So, um, so Garth, most, Link- most of the Latin we sing on these things is absolute made up nonsense. <laughs> um, it sounds like Latin, but we're just. <laughs> Every single time, it's great. There's actually, <laughs> I actually might be on this. I'm not quite sure.
Yay. What do you think of that? Love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, love it. What's not to like? It's what's uh, not it's, to like. I know. What's not to like? You know, it's um, <laughs> it's really interesting because why? You know, when we do all these session sessions with um, with choirs in it, often, often, often the choir is so far back in the final mix, you 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 don't get it. You know, it's just it's mm, something yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but but so it's put into the mix. But it's nice when it's when the choir's really up front. I was doing a. Um, one a couple of years ago and London Voices were the very, very first choir, session choir, to ever sing on a, on a James Bond film track. And we did, I forget which one it was, about three back, two back, but the one that's going around Rome. And mm. so um, Ben Parry, who runs it, convinced uh, that the guys said, look, you know, you're in Rome, why don't you have a choir? You know, think about St. <laughs> Peter's. And that's what they did. So we, we, we were the very first choir to ever appear on a, on a, on a thing. And um, this is brilliant because, um, but why? why? Why do they... Why do they choose that sort of sound? So you've got this plain song at the beginning, this plain mm-hmm. song, which, um, which as soon as I heard it, I thought, oh, th- this is going to move into something because it's it's being sung regularly, so it's in a regular beat. Whereas yeah, yeah. plain song is is much more fluid and will taper away and then come back and sort of comes and goes a little bit. Um, so as soon as it's because it was set four, you're thinking, okay, so this is going to be picked up mm-hmm. and it's going to be become something. So I was aware of that. Um, so even then, the, the, the fact that that it was actually uh, being sung rhythmically and consistently yeah. started to create tension. So you actually start right. to feel that this tension is, is building up. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then of course, when you have that break and then it suddenly cuts back in um, and then you, and you've got all the stuff going on in the background. It, it's great. And then plain song itself, you know, is, is suggests the exorcist. It suggests something <laughs> holy and evil. There's some strange things, you know, why do we hear choral music in that sort of vein and think of devils, or black angels, dark angels, rather yeah, than yeah, yeah. whatever. So, so it, it has that wonderful quality—a kind of, um, you know, holy ritual kind of heavy music. Um, has this dark quality to it as well. This sort of fearful thing that sets you, you know, your nerves on edge and that sort of stuff. Um, and then when it's, you know, hooked up with a really good persistent rhythm and that kind of rock beat, the, the steady four and all that stuff, it's. Um, yeah. It's yeah. very compelling. It drives you on. Yeah. And and it also makes you feel like um, because there are human voices involved, I think there's a, a sort of sense that something's at stake, something real is at stake. It's not yeah. just music to make you feel something. It's like, oh, these people are getting excited. These people are sounding desperate. These people are sounding ecstatic mm-hmm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of, you know, not sort of, it really does connect with human in the human level. Because yeah. we're thinking those, we're hearing a human sing in a particular way or, scream in a particular way and and it builds our own stress up i think as well and, and mm-hmm. excitement um yep so you know it, it, it ticks all the boxes doesn't it really it does see i talk the same way everybody we're on the same <laughs> wave like that's exactly what i i mean yeah that, that's pretty i mean that's it and then too like it's interesting that you know because you're it's a it's a duel between you who a very good fighter pilot pilot and this like king of the skies essentially um who is incredibly good and they're using his body to like create drones and like his his like his movements and stuff to create drones and so on and so forth so like even even just like that sound of the that that jet engine sound you know these little little things that we use in music to enhance that feeling usually of tension but they're all all sorts of different emotions it's just really that when the bassers suddenly did that very long hell bottom C mm. or whatever it was, and they just held it, held it, held it, um, that sort of became went from a kind of church feeling or a, or a, or a Western ritual into something yeah. primitive. It suddenly moves into something much more guttural. Mm. Mm. You, you feel like you're suddenly been launched into a, into an ancient. Egyptian or, or some crazy Indiana Jones movie or something where people are going to be slaughtering people or making sacrifices or something. Uh, <laughs> it, all those frames of reference, because they've been used so often. You know, when we hear uh-huh. that low groan of people doing that, you instantly think of fires and, and, and right. great priests with an axe. And it's sort of that world <laughs> opens up for you, you know. Um, yeah. It is that frame of reference what, what the composers are constantly playing with in commercial music like this. You know, they're, they're not they're not just going into it with a sort of, oh, I quite like the idea of doing this. There's a real sense of, okay, I want to create a world. I want to create a musical world that, that is a frame of reference that people will recognize. So it throws them, it's playing with your brain, um, uh, and it puts you into a particular place so that you're receiving the other information with this this other reference going on. Yeah. Um, so it's it's clever stuff, you know. If, and if it's used well, it can be uh, imaginative, it can be original, it can mm-hmm. be creative. It doesn't have to be just the same old thing, kind of um, 
Yeah. yeah. Well, and I also think that video games, <clears throat> strange luxury of not being tethered to really anything and the creative space is actually unlimited when you think about it. Like there's no, there's no like structure that, I mean, yes, that follows like standard classical musical structure, generally speaking, if in, in terms of pieces like this, but in general, I mean, there's a, a an, an immense freedom that comes with composition in these particular pieces, which is, it's hard to find in, in your standard pop culture music, which follows the specific. One of the, I mean, this was quite complicated in some ways for these singers, because often what happens when we, we do the sessions in, in London at Abbey Road and places, uh, some of the music's so simple. I mean, it's so, so simple. <laughs> but the, 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 the challenges, even for, you know, the best of us who have very good sight reading skills and we've had years and years of experience, the, the, the challenges that you, the, the red light goes on from the moment we start. So at two o'clock we start, maybe, or 10 o'clock, we don't have an hour's rehearsal. We don't look at anything. We say, they say, uh, can we go for 2M10, please? And you open up your pad and you go to 2M10 and you look at it and go, and then the conductor does this and you do that. And the red light's on, you record. And obviously that first recording is not going to be used, but <laughs> sometimes it is. They go, oh my God. And then, so we, we have to get it right. And we have to kind of get the feel of it right straight away. So we, you know, we don't make mistakes, um, very rarely anyway. And, and then, you know, the, the little shifts that the, the, direct, the, the producers and the composers in the box, and sometimes they can be in L.A. and we're in mm -hmm. London, they can be in New Zealand, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and then with the help of the conductor, you know, you just make these little shifts, sometimes microscopic almost. You know, we, we do little things with the shape of the, the vowel. We do – sometimes we turn sideways. Sometimes we, we come in with a kind of uh, rather than a uh, all this yeah. stuff. And, <laughs> and often what's really interesting is often the composer – has an idea that this is possible, but they don't really know what's possible until they get the singers in the until room. Until they hear it, right. And then the singers, say, well, can, and then we say, well, we can do this. Oh, can you? Oh, oh, well, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm, fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then, so that then builds. So, you know, but that was quite complicated because it was syncopated. The mm -hmm. the line structure, the word, the the the, um, the syntax and things of the lines started to become uneven because it, it wasn't looking. It wasn't the stresses changed as the bum bum ba bee ba bum 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 was. Uh, you know, and you're trying to go perpetuum ba dee. You know, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. all, all the stresses are kind of wrong. <laughs> so you just you, you can imagine the terror, the terror on the singer's faces going. At that speed as well. That, that, I, bet, I bet that took about four four takes, maybe more, you know. But, uh. oh <laughs> That's really interesting, though. Oh, God, I can't wait. We have so much more to get through. Let's pause there on yeah, that. because sure No, and we can, it's, it's incredibly interesting. Um, and so I think in this case, let's go, since we were talking about, uh, 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 you, what do you call it? You call it, you called it, I would call it like a uh, Gregorian chant or yeah, like a plain song, plain, plain song. song, plain song. Yes, that's right. Um, uh, let's go to uh, snow and summer. Um, so this is actually in a made up language uh, called the chaos language for a game called uh, near in this case, near Gestalt. And um, it, it's fantastically, I would say avant-garde, but also uh, classically based. Uh, it, it's very interesting.
Isn't that great? That's good. It follows a similar pattern to Archangel, isn't it? But I, I think I think uh, just some some of my thoughts. Uh, it just the the fact that we're using children's ensemble, I think, is such an interesting and fantastic touch. And then I, I think I think also there's some um, uh, because it's a chaos language, which is intended. It's like a mixture of a bunch. It's like almost like a what's it called? Uh, um, <laughs> what's that? Uh, uh, oh God! What's the what, the ro- when you mix all the romance languages? It's called uh, Esperanto. Uh, so. Esperanto, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's not that, but like, but the idea of like combining all these different languages, and then it's interesting because on the suspensions, that's where we have these e vowels that are very pointed and equal. It's very interesting to me. Uh, anyway, those are, I love this track. I was curious about your thoughts on this. Well, the things I've written down that came to mind straight away again, it's the frame of referencing these cultural references that you get. Mm. So, little boys singing uh, in this sort of manner again is either holy or it's evil is again evil, this yeah. balance between this mm-hmm. this weird but they're also they're, they're empowered there's when you hear children sing this sort of music in this sort of context you somehow feel that these voices have power that you know they're they're angels with power they they are they're, they're like the three boys in in um magic flute somehow yeah, they yeah. have you know they have power way beyond their years and knowledge way beyond their years and so they're like looking down and being able to express this this emotion or this 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 um narration or whatever's going to happen next um and somehow they're untouched by it it's just like they're a greek chorus or something but mm-hmm. a child's version um and because they, and they have this pure quality it's sort of this purity about them unsullied and untouchable um but that makes them also curiously distant and dangerous and and um fragile in a way as well uh, it's minor key funereal it it sort of has this sense of a long journey that needs to be undertaken it feels like mm-hmm. someone's setting out <laughs> burdened with loss and these are the, this is the plot by the way okay okay <laughs> so, so <laughs> burdened with loss and they have yeah. this long journey ahead of them and they're determined yeah. to overcome or find mm-hmm. or re, re- seek out or and it you know it, it just and because it's going a very simple essentially a da da di da da mm-hmm. you know just going round and round um but you have these uh, ostinatos and things around them obligato or starting um um it, it just feels like this is never going to end it's never going to end interesting enough when the boy's <laughs> voice is cut out and it was just the orchestral repetition of the whole thing it did for me there was i do you know whatever's going on in the in the in the, the screen at that point the, the, the simple repetition just felt empty. It just felt like it had lost its tension. It lost its mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. sort of purpose slightly. But then when they came back in, um, it, it, it was it was off again in a way. And and then that irregular drum beat that's going on, you know, is picking up off beats mm-hmm. throughout the two, two uh, with a two bar, two measures um, over a two measure period. You know, you've got the basic eight beats over two measures, but actually it's going ba ba ba. Ba 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 ba, and picking up, you know, semiquavers and and sixteenths and all those sort of things, um, makes you feel unsettled. You make feel mm-hmm. the road is rough. It's um, the way ahead is tricky. You know, it, it's absolutely capturing and it's focusing. It's amazing how your mind sort of just starts really creating imagery and 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 storytelling uh, through the music, really. Well, that, that's a very interesting point, and and I've had I actually made a video about this recently, but also just the, in in my discussions with uh, a lot of the folks in in my sort of like community sphere, we've been talking about context and if context matters and if context is king, and I think something that I've sort of realized is that due to training in the musical world, a lot of times we can paint pictures with our mind's eye because we sort of have like a programming of understanding what music is supposed to sound or it's supposed to infer emotionally and thus causing emotions and and so on and so forth. But a lot of folks actually need the visuals connected to the music. And it's much, so it's interesting because like, obviously we understand that video game music must be programmatic. It's not absolute music written for the church or written for funsies. Like there is an intention here. And um, I think it's interesting how if the visuals are on display, if the music is helping it it basically the music becomes training wheels uh, or like on a bicycle because it helps them to experience the raw emotion much, much more deeply based on the visual and the audio. Whereas with me, I've cried from listening to music just because of the way it makes it like the context of my own life comes out. So it's interesting how, Context matters in in this this you know the back and forth yeah. about that. I think you're right about education because the you know my I've been brought up in the world of, of choral music, chorister, classical Your whole music, life, op- yeah. opera, musical theatre, all those things. So my breadth of uh, experience 
not necessarily knowledge, but breadth of experience <laughs> of musics of all sort is is vast. It's absolutely vast. So I can, you know, I, I immediately know when something's written. I might not know by whom, but I've got a pretty good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What it's sort of meant to be. Um, interesting enough, yesterday my wife was listening to a, a BBC, a Radio 3 programme, which is called uh, Music of the Movies or something. It's on every mm. week. And I sort of think it's a bit of a pointless programme myself because um, – Someone describes the guy describes he, yesterday's theme was pink. Everything was about being pink, and it was whether oh, because of Barbie. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he was going into all these movies that, that reference pink in some way, and then so telling a little bit about it, and then playing the music, but without the actual imagery. The music sort of is meaningless a lot of the time. It's just you know it's there to support the imagery, as you said. Mm-hmm. It's helping um now just occasionally you know in the olden days of course of movie making uh, and and a lot of mu- movie screenwriters now the um, music composers complain about this is they say we're not allowed to write great tunes anymore great melodies you know lara mm. or, or whatever it might be uh, dr shivago or th- these <laughs> extraordinary epic beautiful beautiful exquisitely yeah. and the, the, the henry mancini songs that went with it all this stuff they don't, the, the producers don't want that now. They want music that is 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 micro in, uh, managed in a way that fits the action, that supports the action, that doesn't necessarily step out. But when the music is allowed to step out, it's amazing. It's quite mm-hmm. extraordinary. And if you think about it, things like uh, the Thomas Crown Affair and and um, uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Mm-hmm. There are complete sections of those movies. They're the only music and just action. There's just they're, they're, and the action is just stuff going on, but the music is is allowed to step forward and just take over for a little bit. Um, so it's it's a fascinating, and the education is thing, because, you know, some people will cry to music that I would turn off, and, and, and the music that, that would draw m- all my emotions out might leave us other people really quite cold. And so I think you're absolutely right, that coupled with imagery, coupled with context, that music then starts to have a different effect, and it has a different, a different effect on the listener and the, and the viewer. Um, because they may never have never come across this sort of music before. So actually, right. when they turn on this thing, I'm going to play a game, suddenly they're getting all this, you know, a thousand years, essentially, of what we've just heard. Exactly. It goes back a thousand years to, to playing to Gregorian chant, um, mm-hmm. only 800 years. That's what it's all based on. You're suddenly getting 800 years of musical history, uh, and you didn't get it. You didn't know, did you? Of course you didn't. But, That's um, the trick of it. Yeah, exactly. And that's what makes it so exciting. You know what I mean? Because there's like a yeah. whole world here that people don't actually understand is connected to like the broader history of musical composition, which is actually amazingly interesting, you know, and, and just like, so, well, you yeah. know, everything learned is learned. Everything we do is learned, isn't it? It's borrowed or learned. Yeah. Um, you know, but when people, when they stick opera suddenly in a movie or in, in uh, um, soundtracks for video games mm-hmm. and you get uh, an operatic gesture, um, People don't run away from that. They don't get. They don't think, "Ooh, it's opera." I can't. They listen. pull in. Yeah, absolutely. I know. And so, and then if you sort of think, "Okay, well, let's just take that." And and the problem is slightly time scale thing because, you know, you get four minutes, six minutes, ten minutes maybe of something, and it, and it turns you on, and you get excited about, it and you listen to it. How do you then say to someone, actually, there's a load of that stuff in this three-hour opera? If you want to. <laughs> Want to try it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, that's so funny. Well, I, I, and I've started doing like um, operas with an opera singer where we'll watch an opera and then I'll literally just talk through the whole thing, which is not the intended. I mean, that's not ideal. But, I never want to sit next to you in an opera ever. <laughs> <laughs> but, for, but for a lot of folks who are un, uninitiated or sort of intimidated by the art form, if you're able to express to them what it, what is happening, you know, and, and why things are the way they are, in yeah. the context of the music, suddenly there's a curiosity there. It gets fires the synapses, you know. Well, well you're interested, and, and I think this time scale thing is really important. We now live on a, you know, on a second by second. Mm-hmm. Everything's there all the time, and the. And so, what I try to explain to to, to when I'm directing in various things is um, what an opera character is experiencing in 1680 or 1720 or 1790 or 1850 are you know apart from putting aside the the worry of of cars and phones and modern life but essentially the the business of being alive and being a human being are exactly the same you know we fall in love we fall out of love we have sex we don't have sex we die with all this is what it's all about 
but it's the speed of which it's running. Now, we are an incredibly sophisticated um, society now because of the speed of digital, the digital world we live in mm -hmm. and the layers that we understand. You know, when we're watching a, a film or a TV or a Netflix, whatever it might be, there are so many layers going on to these things. Um, and we get them as an audience. For the most part, we get them without even questioning. It, it, to step into the world of opera or symphonic music or classical music, which where all this stuff is derived, um, does demand, in a way, a, a stepping away from that space, right. stepping, stepping into a world where you say, this woman who is going to scream at me vocally for the next 12 minutes <laughs> is essentially struggling with the same thing that took 30 seconds in my game right. but it's now we're going to live it out we're going to experience it more you know we're going to, to sort of um so i think if people c c do are interested the thing to do is just turn that that speed thing down just turn it down and just let it come to you just experience it and imagine the real life trauma of, of something that's really going on on stage uh, you know, in, in some ways, opera is is in time scale sometimes more real than movies because you know we allow mm -hmm. someone to sing an aria for twelve minutes because they've lost somebody and they are distraught or they are yeah. terrified. You know, whereas we get thirty seconds in a movie or maybe two minutes or something. <laughs> Andy, you're right though; it is more. Uh, let's move on though. But, but so yeah, the conversation is great. I know, no, it's awesome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Please make sure to like and subscribe this video. Thank you. Um, <laughs> listen to all this knowledge. No, no, but but actually, I mean, I think it's an interesting point you bring up too, because as you know, with like let's say with grief, like you just mentioned, twelve minutes of an aria is more realistic than thirty seconds because grief is a thing. I mean, it took it took uh, m my grief counseling ended at exactly a year and a half after my father passed, and that and I started to feel better around month. 11 uh, of going to grief counseling because you know you wait a little bit before you start but she i said to her i said i feel very strange about this how come i feel now that i don't think about him with that sort of pain and suffering and she was like because this is the natural process and that natural process takes 12 minutes of opera time to to do in real life so you're right in that sense where it's like you know 30 seconds in a movie kind of you kind of like highlight it but the truth of the matter is that the longer a piece is in a, in a, in a music I I situation the more you actually it's more akin to real life it's very there's, okay, a, there's a wonderful movie called truly madly deeply uh, with juliet stevenson made golly 20 odd years ago maybe 30 years ago now but there's a sequence uh, where where essentially she just cries for a long time um and it, it's a terribly painful to watch. Um, it's about the loss of her husband, I think. I, I can't remember quite the story. Uh, and it stood out at the time as being a remarkable, sort of daring, dangerous, you know, asking an audience to essentially sit with someone mm. grieving, deep, mm. deep grief. And people don't want to do that. Very, very tricky. The thing about <laughs> opera, of course, is you can experience this, but actually you have this music that allows you, that keeps it moving, keeps it, mm -hmm. keeps the storytelling going and allows you to move to a different place. And by the end of it, you, you, you know, you have arrived somewhere else maybe. Yeah. Um, it's, it's all, it's all complex stuff. I know. I know. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's pivot uh, to something that isn't uh, classical music. Uh, and then, oops. Tracks I want to share with you. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> This is uh this is by Chris Christodolo. It's called The Rain, formerly known as Purple, which is an homage to Purple Rain by Prince. I'm sure you know that song. Yeah. Uh, that wasn't like an age comment, just for the record. Just saying. <laughs> You've heard of the Beatles, haven't you? <laughs> but uh but this is, a... like, this is by Mozart. That's not an age comment. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Uh, so this track, this track, uh, it's really interesting to me because it has a very slow build and then it, it's, and, and it's very like has a, a jazz, jazz piano and it's very, 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 well, you'll, you'll, you'll hear it pretty much instantly, but it, it, it's a wonderful track. And then obviously there is of course an homage to Purple Rain there near the end that is just so satisfying once we get there. So I just want to, it's, it's a little bit longer. It's about seven minutes and 58 seconds, but I think that the build up and the, when I first listened to it, I was like, okay. You know, I did that thing you were just talking about where I was looking at my watch and I was like, all right, let's go. And then when I finally allowed myself to listen to the whole thing, I realized what an incredible composition it is. So I'll be very curious to hear what you think once we're okay. on the other side. <laughs>
<laughs> Love it. Yeah. Pretty meditative to a degree as well. Good driving music. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, I love the homage to Prince there, though. That thematic, the thematic, like you know, recap of that melody is so satisfying, especially when you clue into what it is. Yeah, it went above my head. I'm afraid. So <laughs> <laughs> it was near the end. Near the end. Yeah. I kind of got it. I got the idea. Um, yeah. When you started playing games, I mean, you, you know, this is your generation, your era, the whole video game thing when, when it's really coming to its own. Um, mm -hmm. Were you aware from when you were a child the sort of the effect the music was having on you? Uh, not until I started playing Final Fantasy uh, games. When I started playing Final Fantasy seven, eight, nine, and they're not related story wise. So every 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 game has different uh, music. That was when I sort of I would actually attribute uh, Final Fantasy the series musically th being the reason for why I went into classical music. Uh, and I used to listen to like piano covers uh, in the CD player and like I was obsessed with the melody. And melody has always been the most important part of music to me. Uh, so, no, I didn't realize it until it had happened, and then yeah, it happened. Yeah. Yeah. I often think that National Music Day should be National No Music Day, so people actually sit and realize that if you take away music from everything, TV, radio, cars, lifts, uh, superstores, whatever it might be, um, you know, what is the experience? What is a world without music? Um, we, we abuse it so much, that the nature of music, it's, it's you know, because it's so important. It's, it's there all the time. Um, so I, just, I thought this was really interesting. I love, because it, it seemed to me there was so much going on. So it reminded me lots of stuff. So the, the, and because of the different instrumentation, so the mm -hmm. fact they were using uh, the real thing or, or a digital version of Yamaha C3 organ with the Leslie speakers, um, instantly gives you a kind of jazz, 70s, gospel, right. uh, 80s, all that sort of stuff, that feel, um, which is, I just love, I love that sound. The fact that it was absolutely a kind of standard rock ballad feel, you know, the slow rock ballad uh, in four. The, um, and the fact that essentially it was a repeated four, four note structure over and over again, uh, a kind of ground bass. And I was thinking as well, you know, this, this rock thing, which is this ground bass, essentially, the bass just does the same thing all the way through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, people had cottoned onto this, several hundred years ago, Purcell and Bach and people, knowing exactly the, the, the um, and, and things like the, everybody has for their wedding, the um, Parker Bell Cannon, Cannon. Bell <laughs> Cannon. This, this repetition, it, it gives you a kind of security. You know that it's going to be built on above and that the, 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 the harmonic varieties that are going to go above it and, and the colors add to the sort of tension of the excitement. So tubular bells is one of, you know, this is very much tubular bellish. Tubular bells goes on and on and on and on and on and on. He just keeps adding instruments, adding instruments, and he announces them, which makes it even you know, tubular bells. Um, slightly distorted guitar. <laughs> uh, and it's, I, you listen to this day and go, I so love this. It's so exciting. It sort of just gets me, and I remember listening to it as a kid. Um, so, you know, and this is exactly what this does. It essentially has this very simple, ground bass da -de -da -da. Mm -hmm. and then and that's mirrored in the final uh, of all the solos all the bits they have da -de -da -da, at the end of each uh, uh, section so which you can kind of hook into you know it's then going to be repeated the next uh -huh. bars or 16 bars um but at the same time it just feels like it's you're just driving you're meditative you're there you're in a groove i put nice mm -hmm. groove nice uh, it's, rela it's relaxing and those standout guitar solos are pure 1980s yeah rock. You know, the world of which is actually an interesting point about how electric guitar melodically speaking is actually in some ways even more to me to me is actually more enticing than the voice sometimes because of the range of that electric guitar it's like yeah. such a it's like it's such like a, like a tenor key type thing but it also is so incredibly satisfying and like i feel like the emotional output of an electric guitar as it ascends up is so incredibly emotional I think it's, it's so the same cool. as a violin, isn't it? You've got the violin. Yeah, yeah. You can play pretty low on a violin, but then you can get stratospherically sure. high. Um, and so that that stretch, I think you're absolutely right. You know, I never really thought of it like that, but I think you're right. And that sort of plaintive cry that the, the, the electric guitar can have um, can really tune you. When, it, when it's great, it's really good. Well, it's like um, uh, Thais variations. You ever heard of the Thais meditations? Yeah, yeah. Not variations, meditations. Like that is a prime example of when the violin, yeah. and if you've never heard of the Thais uh, uh, meditations, you absolutely should. They're absolutely stunning. But, you know, just that ascension up into the, yeah, it's, it's gorgeous. Yeah. Anyway, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think well, something that came to mind. So I was thinking, 
you know, this this ground based thing is is it hooks you in. It's a very secure but exciting possibility because you know that things are going to develop above it, and 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 then you get these clashes. You get clashes of sounds. You get clashes of instruments together. And sometimes you get harmonic clashes, and you get suspensions, and and so it's constantly sort of evolving, evolving, and yet the roots, you know, the ground base keep keeping you, yeah. Roots stay there. It's like a sort of tree, you know. It just keeps doing all this wonderful stuff, but underneath this this thing continues to be. And I was thinking as well, you know, that I don't know how much of this is. You know, there could have been. I guess there may be two or three minimum four musicians involved in this, but this could have been if they'd all played separate instruments, something like twenty or thirty, mm. or if they all picked up the separate thing, they're just going to do that little tune for. And I was thinking to myself, you know. What people often don't realise when they're listening to this stuff, whether it's in the movies or in, in videos, is the fact that there's a 60-piece choir singing, that there's a, a 60-piece orchestra. I mean, often the orchestras aren't that big. The orchestra's about 32, but mm. they have a full range. It's a symphonic orchestra, and they'll add to it. They'll have a, you know, electric guitars, they'll have saxophones, whatever they need. So it's a kind of morphed version of a, of a classical orchestra. Um, and to this day, you cannot, you cannot... Uh, replace that with digital information or sampling. You just can't. The, the variety of voices you get across 60 people, 30 people, 20 people, I'm about to do a session this weekend, there's 40 of us, I think. Um, you know, the, the, the breadth of sound you get, The the even though we all breathe together, supposedly, we all come off mm. and say together, that, that intangible um, quality of, of human beings kind of using something that is so unique to yourself yeah. and individual to yourself, but you're trying to do it with the next person. Um, likewise with fiddle players and all those things. Uh, you know, I guess maybe horrible AI, maybe one day will do something, but I hope it doesn't. Um, and I was thinking, you know, so often people don't realize that. Why do they do that? Why do, why do the producers of these things say to the composer, what do you want? And the composer says, I'd like a 40-piece orchestra and a 60-piece choir. And the producer goes... <laughs> You serious? You know <laughs> that's going to cost us. Are you serious? You know it's going to cost the, the daily rates for all those singers. It's going to cost right. the recording studios. They do it in Abbey Road. They do it in Air. They do it in Los Angeles. They do it in these major, major things. That that's an expensive, expensive day out for everybody. Mm -hmm. Why do they do it? Why do they do it? Because th at the moment they value it. They value that the, the what music does. They know that this is a, a, a thing that you know, as you say, sort of holds the context, holds the story, develops the story. And they respect it and like it enough and want it enough to realize that getting brilliant musicians involved, getting people who care about the sound they make, that every time they touch the violin string, every time they approach the trumpet, every time they do a riff on a guitar, it means something to the person playing it. The individual. It's not, it's not just a, a thing that's written. And as a singer, you know, myself, I know that when I open my mouth, and as you do too, that you you can't help but care. You can't mm -hmm. help but want to do something that's got some value to it and some quality. And I think, you know, when you get that sometimes, just sometimes, not all the time by any means, but sometimes the atmosphere in in the recording studio is is electric. It's fantastic. It's amazing. Even though we're all kind of hardened, you know, cynical, come in, dump the bag, open the thing, sing, take the money and go. Um, <laughs> we've always got something else to go to. Yeah. Just sometimes I turn to, to my friend Ben Parry, who's, you know, one of the leading conductors these days of this sort of stuff. And uh, and I say, you know, that, that was that was cool. That was a good one. He says, yeah, yeah that, was, that was something special today. Um, other days, not so much. But... Uh, <laughs> I just think it's exciting that this this that world exists um, and it's being appreciated by audiences that may not necessarily be drawn to a concert. Well, exactly. <clears throat> exactly. Should we keep going? We should keep yeah. going. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. All right. Yeah. So, so, so actually, oh, I'm good. I'm glad. Me too. So something, it's funny that you, this is a good segue because there is a, uh, a piece that I want to talk about from Final Fantasy 16. Uh, I talked about the Final Fantasy series has now been around for 35 years. Obviously, you sang in the 25th anniversary concert. They just released um, the 16th iteration. Now, all of these are their own standalone stories. And this one in particular, uh, it, this is called Ascension. And uh, to me, it's really, truly uh, uh, the evolution of classical music and the way that it's written. Now, it is, it is I believe, using synthesizers. Um, but for whatever reason, 
in the particular piece, this particular piece, it doesn't really get in the way because of, I think the visuals and the, and the, the way that it in, embraces the classical Vivaldi and like Bach aspects of it. Serious question here. Because I've never played games like this at all. I don't know. Um, don't you get a bit bored of just having endless battles, constantly battling, <laughs> battling? Uh, <laughs> depends on the stakes. 
Sometimes yes, but in this particular instance, uh, uh, essentially everything you saw there, those are um, people that are have, or they're called dominance, and they have the power of these icons, and these icons allow them to transform into these like monstrous beings. And in this particular instance, that uh, per, that larger dragon is named Bahamut, and uh, he was actually our ally, but he has been consumed by this energy of this crystal, and he's become sort of mad. And in that moment. Uh, he accidentally murdered his own father due to the main boss and stuff. So I think like, anyway, so we're trying to stop him because obviously he's about to destroy the whole world. Cause he's just like, ah, um, then he has no control. And these two brothers, uh, have been separated for like 12 years, I believe. And so they, they merge into one icon and they fight together for the first time. So in that moment, it's pretty exhilarating. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it, it can get a little long for sure. I mean, in th- that battle in particular is actually like like a full ten minutes or longer. Um, it, it, it yeah, there's a lot of battle. There's a lot of rhythmic battle music in video games for sure. Um, so when you're playing it, that music kicks in. So you're you're. Yeah, it's, right, it's rising along to that music. It's it's di- diegetic, di- diagenetic. Well, what's that? Non-diegetic, phrase? diegetic. Diegetic is when it like is influenced by something that happens on the, screen, and then it. Diegetic is it's happening. So if I turned on the radio now, so you know, diegetic is um, I'm in the car, uh, and and I'm listening to the the radio, and then the, the camera leaves the car, and the music becomes the back of the soundtrack that's non-diegetic i think mm-hmm. so diegetic yeah. is when it's in the room with you and then non-diegetic oh. is uh, no so it's dynamic i guess it's so like if something happens th- there's there's a moment uh, there this happens all the time in video games. it happens in this game actually like you'll be walking along and there's like forest music and then you enter into a battle and it's the forest music slightly modulated and slightly thematically changed so that it becomes battle music and then it, and then once you're out of battle or like a specific thing will happen in a video game and the minute that this thing happens the music shifts and it's sort of it's dynamic in that way so anyway to answer your question yeah sometimes but that's also why people like it you know in this particular case that's a very story driven game with the emphasis is actually on the story and that but music the stories as well the stories i mean this just seems to me um so if you in in medieval times if you go to the uh the, the, the cathedral albi in in france um there's, you know, there's these, ex- and one of the end, there's an extraordinary uh, day of judgment uh, murals on the wall. These great, mm-hmm. enormous things, mm-hmm. 100 feet high. And on the, the left hand side, as it were, you're tumbling down into hell and you see all these terrible, ghastly, gory things going on. And then on the other side, you see you're rising up to the right hand of God and you're going to sit on mm-hmm. the right hand of Jesus. Or mm-hmm. um, and so, and it's absolutely aimed at a, an illiterate, um, uneducated congregation coming in and they sit and when they, they look at these stories and they say if you're bad you end up on that side right. and if you're good you end up on that side and so much of these these video games seem to be essentially that sort of illustrative religious themed good evil um about some sort of morality against immorality some sort of you know challenge uh do you think do you think that i mean is it becoming a kind of pseudo religion this kind of thing that that we you buy in you know you're up to 35 years of final fantasy and you're Mm. still battling uh, (laughs) with good and evil it's a kind of endless religious experience isn't it in some ways I, I think for some people, yes. I think that the stories, because that, that is, especially, especially, I mean, not all games are like this, obviously, but in the case of Final Fantasy, yeah, there's always this moment where you are fighting a big bad and the music, you know, I'm sure you sang One Winged Angel on that concert you did. Um, you know, or in Final Fantasy VI, you fight literally uh, a, a, a clown, a jester that becomes a god and he destroys the planet and a bunch of really messed up shit happens because of him. Uh, yes, and that's Dancing Mad. It's got organ music in it. It's 13 yeah. minutes long and people revere it. Yes, yes, of course. In Final Fantasy, in general, there's always this conflict between good versus evil and they just modify it around. So to answer your question, yes, I, I do think, and I, and being a part of the fan base, there is a certain degree of i wouldn't want to call it religiosity but there is certainly uh something that is appealing about about that that quality of good versus evil that do you think that's because you can actually do something about it you can actually win you can you can see good overcome evil maybe yeah for me personally i i don't know i I, you know that's a really interesting question because i've never even asked myself why i love those games so much um 
I mean, I really love the characterization. I love the characters. I love the lore. And and yeah, I guess so. I guess there's something so satisfying about uh, Darth Vader type and, you know, the force of good versus the force of evil. And yeah, I suppose if we're looking at it from a psychological perspective, yeah, probably. I mean, the idea that like at the very end, you know, it's also a formula. You know, you're going to fight the big bad and, and that is satisfying when you beat it. And then also the music happens to be very good. And that is one of the main reasons why I play it because the music is phenomenal. Um, yeah. Are you saying that because it's like sort of boring or, or is like, it's sort of like lack of surprise? No, or? I just wonder whether it's a sort of, um, well, a sort of a comfort place in a way, a place that people go to because actually there's some I think sort yes. of recognition. Like yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and for a lot of people in a way, organized religions a bit like that it's a place of security and repeated stuff and safety and all that stuff i think also connection to characters which so it's interesting because i actually don't i don't really like associate like bonds to character i don't think this is a single video game that i'm like oh that character i love them i don't but there are many people that uh, attribute and connect to and attach themselves to character. I mean, I mean, I guess that's not true though I, for me. Cause I could say like the office, I used to watch the office, the American, the U S English version of the office. Um, I, sorry, the U S version, not the, the English version. Um, I used to watch that every time I was depressed because like connecting <laughs> with those characters would somehow like fill some void. So yeah. I suppose in theory, yes. I mean, that's actually a really interesting point for the comments. If you want to, you know, do you, how do you connect to final fantasy? If you connect to final fantasy, be curious to see what other people's responses are. And, and the music is huge. It's just, it's just epic, epic, it's epic, a, epic yeah. music. Not all of it. Of course, there are like nice town themes and things that are not epic. I'm giving you a lot of epic stuff today. on. Action. I love the fact that as well, that he was, um, which composer did that one? Number 16. Uh, Masayoshi Soken. Right. He's the cool. uh, he's the predecessor or the not the predecessor the uh, the 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 uh, who's the, the what's next? Well, he's the composer after Nobu Uematsu, who was the the composer of uh, who the came first. to the concert of the Royal Albert Hall, and when he stood up and walked around, the place went yeah wild absolutely wild and he's a self-trained musician i mean it's actually really? astounding you know what i mean and you yeah. sang his works like a yeah. lot of his works are wonderfully i mean there's like themes from final fantasy 3 that are just so beautiful and so classically based i mean there's yeah, just, yeah, yeah. you know yeah no it's a bit like a superstar. there was everything in that one there was there was a whole slavic dance moment where everyone sounded like they were russian or peasants <laughs> you know or, or something doing some sort of Easter it was probably dance. the journey from it was probably distant worlds was it distant worlds no, but the one I've just listened to then, there was a whole kind oh, of this Slav- one. Slavic oh, yes, section. Yes, 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 uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes. And, uh, and then there was a bit of Mozart in there, and there was a little bit of, um, you know, the, the, the bigger choral stuff. It was fun. I mean, it's great fun to listen to. Uh. Well, then let's, <laughs> let's switch gears then, and we'll do something different then, because we have had a lot of intense... Let, let's listen to... Okay, yeah. So I actually want your perspective on... Uh, oh, this is another battle theme, though. Falls. Okay, well... So this one features ancient Chinese, which is really interesting uh, from the actually this just came out. Um, it features hold on music from it's uh, lyrics from uh, the Don Don Dong Zhu Dag Dag game, the grand song of the Dong people. And so this company, Mihoyo, um, their games feature a lot of uh, ancient, like with pretty much everything they do. So like they have multiple regions in the game. Uh, The first region was called Mondstadt. That was all based around Western wind instruments because the God of that area is the, the God of the wind. And then you have Li Yue, which takes place in ancient China, their interpretation of it. And so you had a lot of Chinese instruments. And then in Azuma was Japanese instruments. So you have a lot of giant Japanese, but then you would have like trap music combined with the Japanese instruments. And so this is from a game, Honkai Star Rail. And uh, it's a very good piece. And it still somehow is modern, uh, but connects to that sort of uh, the, the Chinese culture. Um, and I, find it, I find it fascinating. Uh, and uh, yeah. Let me know when you're ready and I'm ready to go. Here we go. Too many battle themes. I'm sorry, but that's just how today went. (laughs) (laughs) I'll find some slower stuff. I got some slower stuff in here.
different kind of battle theme? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that just as a piece of music, apart from those little sections where it takes off and does something entirely different, um, for me, that was kind of, you know, I can imagine in context, it's great, it's exciting, but it's sort yeah. of very, very basic, basic, basic music just <laughs> at a very, produced at a very high level. So you yeah. can just throw things at it. Um, so, you know, that, that as, a, as a piece of music, I sort of thought that was pretty pretty basic obvious kind of stuff but done at a very high level of interest yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, on yeah. nice machines that can produce some interesting sounds as soon as he got away from the just the, the endless door oh, yeah 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 as soon as he actually did you know flew away there's a nice little key change at one point but it only lasted about three seconds um you know that's when my ears pick up that's when i get excited i, I, I think you know i why haven't I listened to rock music in my life? It's because I actually get bored. I get bored uh, um, mm-hmm. of the repeated ballad and just the, the chorus going round and round and round. I just get bored of it. So I listen to jazz because jazz doesn't go round and round. It does. Yeah, 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 <laughs> it goes right. in different places. Um, so I think from, from my mind anyway, um, some, you know, some rock just makes you feel great. You just think, I just, mm-hmm. this is great. I feel great. But actually listening to it as a kind of, I'm going to go and listen to some rock, it's quite a rare thing for me to do really. Um, it has to, you know, I get the certain things that I find quite exciting, um, you know, certain punk aspects and that stuff. But, um, yeah, for me, that was, that was kind of boring, but beautifully boring, you know, interestingly boring. <laughs> boring. Expensively no, boring. No, I think uh, that's, that's fair. And I, I think, I think that there's a lot of hype around that. And I think in context, it makes a lot more sense. There are other tracks. If there's time that I can show you from that like area of the gaming world that are, are pretty interesting. And actually I would like to shift to, because you have such a, a, a diverse background in uh, musical theater. Um, there's a track here from this game called Ark Knights called Awaken, which uh, is, is very Stephen Sondheim uh, heavy. <laughs> or in uh, uh, composer Adam Gumman wrote this, and uh, you know Adam has a a, a wide uh, knowledge of Disney and sort of this sort of you know musical uh, style that I, I I really uh, dig. And this particular track I, I love personally, but I'm very curious to hear your perspective on. Make a list, write it down in time Sometimes we need it all, sometimes resign To a world where the center is never aligned Make a move, take it back, it's mine Gathering drops and filling the ocean I'll take, take every part of me, take it all and fall Live together and build in a boat Cheers as the horns be Sometimes goes the boats will drown Sights and sounds are forgotten and clear 
like Little Mermaid on Acid. <laughs> Christ. <laughs> I kind of hated that. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> Did you? <laughs> it's too much? Yeah, too much it, didn't really, it didn't know what it was doing. It just seemed like it was, um, you know, it was Little Mermaid, um, Lloyd Webber, uh, Queen, that whole Queen yeah. call stand, thrown into a mixer, Add a bit more, mix it all together. Add a bit of Irish um, uh-huh. folky kind of quality <laughs> to the voice, and you just what the hell was that? Was just, uh, <laughs> I respect that. I love it, but yeah, I totally strip it away. <laughs> strip it away. Get to, get back to, mm-hmm. and also the the feeling of the, the to me that you know as a, as a writer myself the, the the feeling of the words with the music it all felt like it was just too hyper it was too fast it just needed to just i don't know did, did, none of it matched to me really i don't know i found that quite hard work <laughs> <laughs> all right well. I, didn't, I didn't know what it was trying to be i didn't know what it, was. it just seemed to want it to be everything <laughs> yeah i was hoping I, it would stay in seven eight but it didn't it shifted to six eight and that was a shame because all the opening sequence was in seven eight and, going, uh-huh. and then it went and off it went um Interesting, okay. though. I mean, it's an interesting world, isn't it? Suddenly, suddenly you're again. You know, why not? The, the, and if that's if that leads you towards um, uh, another kind of musical experience, why not? Why not? <laughs> yeah. Well, then let's have a palate cleanse <laughs> with some Please. dulcet piano. With some dulcet piano. This is uh, this is uh, Xenoblade Chronicles, uh, the main theme from Xenoblade Chronicles, and uh, I, I think I, I do think you will like this very much. It's very peaceful. Uh, let me know when you are ready. It's getting there, it's getting there. I didn't actually think that voice, as pretty as it was, I didn't really think that voice was suited to the um, the, the music, actually. In what sense? Was it too, like... Uh... I think it needed to, felt to me, needed to be a um, slightly more driving, more driven voice. Um, mm. Less less of the vibrato and the uh, and that slightly sort of Little Mermaid sound needed to be replaced with something more. slightly more hard, I think.
Interesting. I think one of the problems with, uh, <clears throat> to a certain extent, with listening to track after track after track, you start to hear the, the repetitions and the, the sort of... Um, the patterns. The pattern, the tricks that people use all the time. Um, because they kind of work, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. So they keep going back to them. Um, what, what, to my taste, what, what slightly just, this is why it puts me off a bit, is, is because it keeps repeating, it never gets anywhere, it never really develops, you never get beyond the opening sequence. And, ever, and it's a pretty tune, and that's nice, and it starts yeah, quite yeah. nicely. But then they repeat it. Oh, and then they add a violin, and they repeat it, and then you just keep going around, and you never actually develop. It never develops. It mm, just, never it, really, it's just a series of variations um, with mm. layers on top. Uh, so you got ba dee dum dum bum bum mm -hmm. bum 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 which is what's going on. And then finally, it hit a major chord, and you think, oh, and then after one bar, I went back to being to the minor again. I thought, well, what was the point of that? Why did it suddenly, did the sun come out for 30 seconds? Um, but the quartet was a nice touch. That little classical quartet at the end was rather yeah, sweet. Yeah, um, yeah, you know. yeah. So uh, the, the thing that I find frustrating, even when I'm doing the gigs myself and performing, is the quality of the orchestration. And remember, often you have a composer and then you have a whole series of orchestrators. So there's, you know, what you're hearing, it's, it's not that the composer, that's not what the composer didn't want. It is what they wanted. They said, you know, they know they've, they've made it very clear to the orchestrators what they're looking at and everything and then the orchestrator delivers it and then the composer tweaks and decides whether it's what they want so you've you know so it's it's often not just one person it's often two three four five six people in a single uh, track a single track and some and definitely over an album to do with a, a video game you will have lots of orchestrators working for the main composer mm -hmm. um and so sometimes you get fantastic orchestrations. I mean, really, truly, beautifully, you know, beautifully spaced, really intricate, interesting ideas coming through, exquisite solos, all this sort of stuff and nice combinations, uh, which is the work of the orchestrator. We forget that. We should credit them more. Um, you know, even Stephen Sondheim, uh, the great Stephen Sondheim, you know, it's his orchestrators, the Jonathan Tunics of the world, who who made that sound who created in a sense the, the Sondheim sound that we know so well mm -hmm. um, it's as much about them as it is about, about Sondheim himself um, but so what frustrates me is you get clearly these these very excellent wonderful gifted knowledgeable musicians and orchestrators limiting themselves with this small world that they occupy this little you know, a four note theme, a four note bass that goes round and round and round and you never get away from it. And the yeah, harmony never develops, you know. So so after a bit I sort of go, come on, I want something more. I want a bit more meat on the bone. Meat, yeah. 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 So then that and sadly, you know, apart from the violin solo, probably the piano and the quartet, the rest of it was synthesized and it was um Yeah, you know, yeah. And it and it sounds a bit ugly because of that. It just uh but you know, so so I get it, you know. But I'm I'm not a, an Iron Audi fan. I can't bear Iron Audi. I, it, it drives me insane because I just want to go. Please, please, stop repeating those three notes you've just put. Stop it. <laughs> do something. Isn't it? But I get it. People love it. It you know it fills gaps. I don't know. But I I just don't get it at all. It just drives me slightly. No, that's cool. But but to be fair, there's also like, like are you cool with like mm, like three more tracks, four more tracks? Yeah, I'm running out of a little bit of time. I'll probably get you about another ten minutes. So um, okay, let's do you, two more tracks. Another good hour and a half, haven't we now? So uh, yes, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. Let's do let's do two more just because I think I think also like fatigue. It's getting late fatigue. here in Blighty, you know. It's getting past <laughs> time. It's, it's a glass of gin waiting for me downstairs. You understand? <laughs> uh, okay, well then I think let me give you. I'll give you. <laughs> this i wish we could go out for a drink after this and have a pint i know that really this nice. conversation. <laughs> and i'd Let be me... really interested to know i mean you know, i am a bit of a snob at times i am opinionated but i'm allowed to be you know i've had 30 odd 40 yeah, years yeah. Business, so it's not i don't have to like everything but i think and I, but i do have to be a bit careful because sometimes i'm a bit dismissive and i don't like being that but um you know but uh, when you've when you've heard and i'm dismissive of classical music i'm dismissive of, of jazz sure. sometimes because i think sure you know, we've been there, we've done that. You bring up an interesting point to me though, because it's like, I tend to, I don't really have like negative opinions about a lot of this music. And a lot of times I listen to it and I'm like, I love that. Here's why it's very strange. I, I and I'm wondering if it's like, and I'm not trying to appease the audience because they are okay with criticism. So it's, it's sort of interesting to have you have such strong opinions and for me to be like, Everyone, every piece is valid and I like it for what it does. It's very interesting. And I wonder if, you know, it's funny because uh, just a, a quick, I was in a, I was at Des Moines Metro Opera and Michael Eagle was there and we were listening. We were doing like one of these death by Aria things. 
And, yeah. uh, you know, I used to be extremely snobbish about people's vocalism and like who sounded like what. And he said to all of us right before we started, he was like, cause everyone's going to be nervous and stuff. And he goes, I want you to find one thing that you like about every singer's performance, even if you hate their voice. <laughs> and that's a misquote. I mean, that's not yeah, 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 yeah. but, but, and I, it, it really shifted everything for me in the way that I perceive music because I was the guy that like when I put on Ariadne off Noxos I put on literally the first 60 seconds and I said absolutely not this is garbage and then I actually listened to it in full and it's one of the most moving pieces of opera I've ever experienced in my entire the life most moving piece of garbage you've ever listened to <laughs> <laughs> but the point is like I find it interesting that you you and and Costis and others have have had very strong opinions of what they like and don't like and I'm wondering to myself why don't I have strong opinions about what I like and don't like, you know? And, and well, I think, I think it depends on its context again, isn't it? You know, I'm, I'm, um, I am critical by nature and I've spent my life doing this and being in the world of music. So, uh, you know, it's, I guess if you're a chef and someone hands you a fairly basic cheese sandwich on a slightly, <laughs> you're going to see the bread, benefits of how good you know, a cheese sandwich you're gonna go, <laughs> this cheese is, you know, I've, I've, it's not good, and the the bread is stale. Um, yeah. Thanks, yeah. thank you. I'll eat it. You know, I'm hungry. <laughs> um, and I can imagine this is suitable if you're out for a walk on a mountain and you, you need some food. Yeah. Uh, but, but there's better food out there, and and so I think you know, it's it doesn't hurt to be a little bit choosy, and it doesn't hurt to be to know. I think what's really important is I think it's very good that you say, what do you like? What I teach my students is. Um, to be critical, to be able to critique things. So when you like something, you don't just say, I like it. You then ask yourself why you like it. Um, and if you don't like something, you're not allowed to say, I don't like it. You're allowed, to, you're allowed to say, I don't like it because. This didn't do it for me because. This performance didn't whatever because. And so you, 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 you have to be specific. So I know why I don't like this stuff. I know why it doesn't do anything for me. And I, as I explained, you know, for me, it's repetitive. It's, mm -hmm, it's slightly mm -hmm. empty. It's a mm -hmm. little bit like a gilded piece of tin you know essentially you've got yeah. a bit of metal and we've now put some nice pretty plasticky rhinestone things on it and it's a bit better but it's still just a bit of basic metal whereas some of the stuff you played earlier even though yes it was derivative yes it was pastiche yes it was you know using stuff before it was imaginative it was clever it was imaginative it was uh, very vibrant in its orchestrations it was um interesting how it developed how it grew how it expanded mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um but the last couple i think uh, uh, you know i want to say they're a bit lazy, really. It just feels lazy to me to, to be satisfied with that. I sort of think, really? Really? That's that's it? Yeah. Come on. Come on. There must have been another chord you could have used. There must have been another <laughs> little bit of melodic something that might have just taken you somewhere else. So um, and I, think I think you're right. You can't, you can't sit and just complain and criticize and just don't like stuff. I think it's worth thinking, well, why don't I like it? You know, mm -hmm. what, what am I looking for? And why did the last piece do something that this piece didn't? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's completely valid. I also think that sound, that whole piano thing, has been, has has you know been the toxic in in movies now for about thirty, twenty, or thirty years. You get that moment where the piano kicks in. It's and you just go, oh really, <laughs> really? Do I have to listen to a mournful, melancholy piano solo, which is going to last and it's about eight notes and going to last four minutes? <laughs> yeah, I understand. I respect you that. Know, Michelle Legrand, go and listen to Michelle Legrand. <laughs> <laughs> well then uh, let's let's check out this we'll do two more pieces they're both yeah. uh slower so let's do arthas my son first so okay. that's the one i sent you first yeah. i believe that's right that's okay. ready to go yeah here we go. yeah all right Three. this is like your standard choral thing so here we go
When was that one recorded? Oh boy, that was from the uh, Wrath of the Lich King uh, World of Warcraft expansion. So I would say that came out. That came out. That expansion came out in uh, 2008. God, it's been going that long. I did two World of Warcraft. Um, did you? Recordings. Yeah, but well, several. One was for Blizzard. Yeah, um, well, yeah. That came out later, and um, another one but, that was a year, a year before that. So about 2015, 2016. What? Oh, I wonder what expansion that was. Uh, that's cool. So, so you understand like the musical style of this, obviously. Hasn't moved on at all in 10 years. <laughs> I mean, that, yeah. <laughs> they, they, I mean, I think they just tried some new stuff with uh, the new expansion, Dragon Dragon something. But yeah, I mean, in general, it's very like choral heavy and very like orchestral. That's, that and- is absolute. I mean, it's, it, it, again, it does what it says on the tin. It's that's so typical of the stuff we've done over the last 12, 15 years <laughs> of that, that um, chorally big, big epic, but very, yeah. very simple over a rhythmic bass that's pounding away and um uh you know it, it it's background music that one definitely background music it, it uh it, it's it, a cinematic it's, it's cinematic. cinematic it pushes show, everything yeah. on it's a big gesture yeah it's lovely yeah. i mean it's it's it works you know it works it works it, and and you'll hear that in the 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 um da vinci code you'll hear yeah. that in, in james bond or whatever you know or mission impossible that's exactly that sort of sound we get this kind of epic choral thing in the background mm-hmm. with this well, there's like some big crazy stuff happening on, yeah, on screen. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's sort of just, it makes it, again, it just raises the stakes. It suggests there's something more important than the individual. There's something epically worldly or godly or holy or heavenly mm-hmm. or something. Um, it's uh, It works. It just works. It's a, fra- it's a cultural reference point in the West, especially, yeah. that we get all of the time. It's just there in big epic movies and, and games all of the time. Yeah. Um, and it's there for a reason. It, it, it does exactly what it says on the tin. It takes you to a place of heightened awareness and heightened excitement. And, yeah. um, and somehow it's more Im- impressive because there are these heavenly voices and, you know, pleading for mercy or something. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. let's it's, round it's, out. That's, a, that's like a sort of jazzed up version of Verdi Reckham, isn't it really? Aspects I mean, of, yeah, pretty much. Carmina Barana, it's got that same. The same yeah, style. In a way, they're all trying to capture the Carmina Barana element. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great big yeah. Uh, choral gestures. They, I mean, they they work. They're fantastic. I think that's doesn't stand out more than others, but it's it, it's sure. just, it, it's brilliant. You know, it works well. I do want to ask you really quickly. Like, <clears throat> has this changed your um, perspective on video game music at all? Like, what what has this sort of like listening to all of this and sort of one fell swoop? sort of done has it has it done anything has it done nothing like are you is it intriguing is it less intriguing is it you know what what's your what's your take on on video game music now obviously you've performed in a bunch of it but so, so i don't think it's um so i haven't i haven't been surprised by anything in the sense right. of oh that's a really different approach and sound um so, yeah I've, I've everything you've played in a way to that i've sort of done apart from that crazy crazy disney thing um <laughs> although we did we did do the re-recordings of um of uh beauty and the beast for for the for the whatever the release the new release uh-huh. we, we uh-huh. did all, all the all those things so i got to be in in a, a disney <laughs> cartoon thing for a bit um bonjour um <laughs> so what have we learned um i think what I've enjoyed about this is so yeah, the music is the music, and none of it surprised me. I've liked some of it very much, and I've been and, and you know in a kind of tubular bells kind of way, I've gone along with it. You know, it's it's it's, it's exciting stuff, and it's um and beautifully put together. What is interesting, I think, for me is that actually just considering it, what it's trying to do, um, what its aim is, who it's trying to entertain, attract, engage, uh, you know, what it's trying to do for those people who presumably are aged. 12 through to 92 or something, this kind mm-hmm. of enormous breadth of, of, of user. Um, and, and the cultural references that it's using, the, the musical references, the historical references, you know, are clever. There's a lot of clever stuff happening in what you might think is actually bread and butter sort of background music, but, and it's not. And even the, the, the stuff I really didn't like, 
there's some clever stuff. You know, the, the fact that you use a quartet, the fact you move into a, a, a Mendelssohnian sort of world suddenly um, just triggers things. Even if you don't realize it, it, it puts you into the parlor. It puts you into a, mm-hmm. a place of, of ref, refined company. Um, right. You know, this is, this is the chamber music. This is music to be listened to by small groups of people in, in private houses. And um, so there's all that stuff going on that... Um, that, that, that is interesting to me. I think, you know, uh, uh, and I think, yeah, some of it I belittle and dismiss, but actually <laughs> it's still doing the job it's set out to do. It, it's, right. it's actually doing it. And um, could I write it? Some of it, yeah, I think I probably could. And especially if I had a, a synthesizer and could create and just, you know, record <laughs> yeah. as I went. I, definitely, absolutely. Some of it, absolutely not. It's, you know, it's some of it, as you said, is magnificent. It's the, the Purple Rain stuff, I think, was that track I really liked enormously. Um, mm. uh, yeah, I think that for me was the, the, the one that really, I really enjoyed most. I liked, the, I liked the one before that, the Boys Voices one. The, 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 Snow the, and Summer, yeah. Enjoyed that very, very much. I like the opening one because that just ticked all the boxes. Exorcist, plain song chant, went into a driving beat, all yeah. that stuff. It's the last two or three, you know, that I've that have left me a little bit. Um, yeah. Bit, and and. You know, but uh, <laughs> I'm trying to give you a you broad know, range. <laughs> no, it's great. It's great. Um, I, I do think you know it would be very exciting. I'm not, I'm not a games player, but. Um, it would be exciting if, if just occasionally, you know, you, you these composers really did step out into their, their non or a comfort zone they really want to step into and bring us, you know, because there's a lot of more references out there that, that, that you know, that I mentioned Michel Legrand before. We, I listened to him in Thai, you know, about two hours of him yesterday when I was painting. Um, and he's repetitive. Oh, my God, he's repetitive. But is it beautiful? exquisitely so is it from the heart all of the time is it very french yes is it is it does it move me excite me yeah 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 is it jazzy full of jazz you know it's and it's just it's laden with a kind of french exotic sexy 1950s mm. 60s 70s big band whole feel um i would love it you know if, if some of this that sort of stuff appeared a kind of i'm sure there is jazz out there on these these um yeah, uh, but, but you know that that would be really cool. And also, what Michel Legrand did as well, very cleverly, he often used lots of classical influences. So he'd use harpsichord in in what is essentially a jazz sequence. Um, and and then Jacques Lussier, at sort of the same time, a little bit later, created all his Bach jazz on piano and harpsichord, doing jazz versions of uh, of Bach. Um, <laughs> So I like that 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 combination, the layer thing. I really really like. And what's quite exciting when you're doing you're doing sessions, you know, often we get um, synthesized tracks that have been recorded beforehand to just put down, mm-hmm. and that's what we hear, which sometimes sound quite good. And you think, well, why didn't they just use that? But <laughs> what we often get is just a click track, a basic, um, sometimes some sort of accompaniment, um, and we don't often hear the full. Very rarely do we hear the full full effect, but just occasionally they'll play back something. Often we don't hear ourselves in that playback, but they can hear it in the box. But what you suddenly get is the, the, the real depth, breadth and depth of the orchestration and the composer's ideas and what they're trying to do. Um, it, and that's quite exciting when you get that, because you go, oh, yeah, because we're just part of the jigsaw. We're, we're, part of, we're a jigsaw piece that goes into a big right. And that bigger jigsaw is only one piece of the jigsaw that goes into a bigger jigsaw you know, and they're, they're all placed together and, and and we're part of it down here um but i hear that in what they're doing here i you know you you get you get it it's it's and i'm sure if people are listening and i think you're you know what you're doing here on your your podcast and things is just fantastic because if people go back to their games and then and, and stop playing for a minute and lose presumably get killed or something but if they if they stop and go <laughs> Oh God, Marco said this, and that geezer from Britain said that, and um, <laughs> and, and that's really interesting because I just heard it for the first time. I just heard that noise, that sound, that layer. I I, I can hear what they're trying to do now, and I've been distracted, and you've ruined the game for me forever. Um, <laughs> you know, that's that, that's fantastic, isn't it? I think because it is there. None of these people doing this are anything less than very talented. You know, hey, well, are. exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. point. They really are. Um, 
Well, okay. Let's let's finish up with this track. I'll let you go and be on your merry way. Thank you for taking extra time. I appreciate that. This is uh, uh, from a game called Genshin Impact. It's a similar style to that other track I played you for, uh, the Fantalia theme that you felt was a little repetitive and boring. But this one, I think you will like. And if you don't, well, then I guess completely wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so... It's well, you see, that's the thing, though. It's it's you know we, essentially, if you think about it, cooking, cooking, cooking is is a, a, apart from doing really weird things that people occasionally do, <laughs> is a series of taking similar ingredients, processing them right. in a way. So, egg on toast, poached egg on toast, fried mm-hmm. egg on toast, scrambled egg on toast, right? <laughs> be boiled egg on toast, and each of them is. is you know, references the other, but each of them has its own quality. And I think you know what when when the stuff works, um, when this when the film soundtracks really work, is it's not necessarily that they're trespassing into a whole new world because they're not. It's what they do with it. It's what they're doing with the mix. It's the ingredients they're using and how they cook them up. Right. Live at a place. I read something recently about um, maybe some of your listeners and viewers will know. Um, Ravel's um, Bolero that goes round and round and round. There's a simple theme, a double theme, mm-hmm. like 20 odd bars. Um, it's like that. <clears throat> the drum goes all the way through it. 171 repeats on the side drum. That's terrifying. Even more terrifying is the guy who has to join him halfway through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the other guy. Yeah. But what I have, so you, this piece goes on and it's very, very famous. But what it's really famous for at its time was he was coupling instruments that had never been coupled before. So he'd stick a piccolo with a trombone or a clarinet with a mm. thing with a harp. And, and suddenly you get these, and he puts them in fourths and fifths. So you get these overtones, these harmonic overtones, um, which sound oriental, they sound magical. No one had ever done this before. They'd never put you know, a, a, a clarinet with, um, I don't know, a, a bassoon at, at a particular interval doing... That's what makes that piece utterly, utterly remarkable and listenable to. Because listen to because it's it's brand spanking new. When right. he wrote it, it was brand spanking new. It's not even a bolero, by the way, because it's too slow. But it's um, it's a brilliant piece of music. Yeah, and you could easily say, "Well, this just repeats. It's boring." But when you actually yeah. like isolate those and.
So glad we ended with that one. Yeah, I know. I was worried. <laughs> so glad. That was great. I love that. I love yeah. it. Why do I love that? I love it because, because, because it's a mixture of the Adams Family, Wednesday, the good, the bad, and the ugly, French influences, definitely a bit of Michelle Legrand in there. And yeah. it's comic. It's comic. It's actually building, you know, to me, that feels like a comic caper kind of movie. Um, uh, I don't know. Um, Sherlock Holmes, you know, that could mm, be that sort mm -hmm. of thing. It's, it's got period quality to it. It could be an 18th century, you know, Netflix production with, with, right. je with jazz guitar or rock guitar attached. Um, that was fun. I mean, that was just fun. That was like they were having a lot of fun. Lots of stuff happening in the orchestra, lots of lovely. And that single um, tubular bell, the dong, mm -hmm. just immediately says to me, you know, cowboy, western, <laughs> Montana or something, you know, that dong. And then you see the, the baddie standing with his guns ready. Um, but then the, the lovely cascading violins is funny. It's funny. It's, it's, it's mischievous and... Um, Extremely so. You know, it, it feels like a, a, an art movie, that, you know, an art robbery or something. It could be that, all that sort of stuff. It, it, it meshes a beautiful piece of art that's 18th, 17th century. So you've got your harpsichord, yeah. you've got the beautiful buildings, You've got the geezer who's go, the guy who's who's the who, who's going to do all the bad stuff with the guitar, and you've got the, the, the I don't know the, the, the police chasing. It's just there's a whole world to me that you know that's great, great right? Who wrote that? That's a uh, uh, his name is Yu Peng Chen. It's a it's a part of a, he's a Chinese uh, composer, and that 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 game that's the game I was mentioning earlier that has all these different regions that have their oh yeah, yeah associated yeah. instruments. Yeah. This was a limited time event too. This was crazy. It was over in like what two months, and then it was done, and then you know, that music never existed in the game again. That's the kind oh, of like commitment oh. to in the in the, the last region was uh, is like a, a southern a Southern uh, Southeast Asian uh, quality to it. So there's a lot of like sitar and a lot of like Persian yeah. influence and stuff. It's, it's very, it's not afraid to be experimental and it's actually no, it was great. It was funny. I like that very, very much. Really cool. Did. Um, <laughs> Perfect. I was going to say something. I was going to say about it. Um, I was going to say no, just as a finishing note. I can't remember. Um, yeah. There was something in it that I, that sparked my attention. Anyway, mm. whatever whatever i do think oh yeah that was it um mm. talking about michelle legrand if you like that harpsichord effect go and watch the movie the go-between because the okay. i'm just going to listen to the soundtrack um the soundtrack for the go-between is is just magical mm. absolutely magical it's just brilliant and he uses the harpsichord to such good effect i love but, it but it's got this kind of 60s feel to it somehow it's um Hmm. It's just wonderful. Wonderful. I love it. Love it. Love it. Okay. Um, the go between. I'll check that out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Garth, I, I thank you so much for, you know, uh, coming on, giving your thoughtful opinions, uh, both, you know, on the positive <laughs> side and the negative side. I think that that's healthy and beneficial. And, uh, and thank you everybody for watching this. Uh, if you yeah, enjoyed this, you. definitely feel free to, uh, like and subscribe, support the channel. And, uh, and, uh, yeah. And if you want Garth to come back and we'll torture him with more, uh, ec eclectic music, uh, let me know in the comments. I'm for it. I'm for it. It's yeah. been great. Thank you so much, Marco. It's been I, this has been a real lovely journey. I loved it. Loved it. Really great fun. Good. Good. And you know, and hello to all you amazing people out there who are listening to this stuff. Fantastic and learning from Marco. Brilliant. Love it. I did my job. I taught him. I did my job. <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be titled Professor Reacts, or My Former <laughs> Professor Reacts to Video Game Music. Anyway, you should get Greg on this. Greg, Greg needs to come. Oh, that's a him. great idea. Oh, my God. He boy, would. would he talk, and he would be able to tell you a lot. You know, he's, uh, and he would also probably. Anyway, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Uh, <laughs> thanks, everybody, and we'll see you on the next one. Bye.